Welcome to another edition of Bigfoot's Pad Live. Tonight we have Lisa Morton on the show, and we are going to talk about a very interesting book that she wrote called Calling the Spirits, A History of Seances. Um, Lisa does a number of writing for different articles, and you wrote some books and things. So I guess without further ado, did you want to jump straight into it, guys, or did you have any opening sure. statements or anything? No, we can get right into it. Yeah, we can get oh, right into right. it. All right, so I hate to ask this question because I know you answer this probably a hundred times a hundred times a month. But so, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you started into the uh, necromancy? I can't say that word necromancy and uh, the whole tarot and the Ouija boards and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, when I was a kid, I just always loved horror movies and horror stories and monsters and things. Um, mm -hmm. I always describe myself as that weird little girl who wanted to be a monster instead of a Disney princess at Halloween. <laughs> yeah. um, I was kind of lucky to grow up during this sort of golden age of monsters and Halloween here in Southern California. I'm a Los Angeles native. And so I just always loved it. My parents were really indulgent and would watch horror movies with me. And yeah. my dad would help me make monster models and all kinds of stuff. That's like awesome. That. Yeah. That's um, cool. Oh, yeah. yeah but I got into actually wanting to be a writer. Um, I just always kind of naturally veered towards horror, and um, it started with fiction, and then later on, I got into nonfiction. Oh yes, uh, I was reading. You have a number of awards with the Bram Stoker, uh, Bram Stoker Award. Is that what, the, what it's called? Or so, uh, what is that exactly? Like, so, like, how do you get one of those? Or like, what what is that exactly? That is given out by the Horror Writers Association, which is the world's largest professional organization for people who write the stuff that I write. Um, awesome. They give mm -hmm. the awards out once a year. They're kind of, um, it's sort of easy to describe them as the Oscars of horror. They give them in, I think it's now 13 categories. Um, mm -hmm. And I am very lucky to have won it six times. Yeah, congratulations. And yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll jump into some questions about your book. Um, I know you wrote other books too, but for this, for the, for this specific interview, we're going to talk about calling the spirits, a history of seances. Um, some of the questions I have are kind of unrelated to the book. Yep. There it is. But they're kind of similar on topic. Um, the best way to word this, I went through the book and I wrote down some questions and things that I thought were interesting and then after that, I have another set of questions that are kind of just all over the place that I couldn't necessarily put them in a specific category. Um, the very first question was, was about, uh, we're going to go in chronological order in your book. For necrom is necromancy, is I say necromancy, necromancy? Uh, necromancy is what I usually hear, but I think it may be open to interpretation. Yeah. So for our viewers that aren't aware of what that is, can you say what it is exactly and about how far back do you go in your book? That's a specific type of magic that has to do with calling up the dead. And um, it is one of the original forms of magic. It goes all the way back to the um, very earliest people we have. For example, um, there's a, a story in the Gilgamesh epic about him bringing up his friend Enkidu after Enkidu has descended into the netherworld and he calls him back up from the netherworld. Yeah. And it's really a horrible thing because Enkidu ends up essentially saying, if I told you everything that's down there, you would cry. Um, and it's really sad and, and scary. And that's one of the earliest examples of necromancy. Um, a lot of people kind of associate it, I think, with the Middle Ages yeah. when there were all yep. of these crazy grimoires and spell books, um, these things that were supposedly by these magicians like Agrippa and Solomon the Mage and... Um, these were the ones that have just the completely nutso, uh, impossible spells, like you could <laughs> yeah. resurrect a spirit who would serve your commands if you got a dragon's eye and went to a crossroad in the middle of the night. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. They are essentially impossible. Yeah. So, um, I know in your book, you the first couple chapters you mentioned that the four of the major civilizations that kind of practice this necromancy, you listed Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Um, 
my questions are kind of about the Rome stuff. So can you describe a little bit about how that existed in Rome or what were they doing spells or was it, uh, what exactly were they doing at that time with, with necromancy? They did actually believe in witches. Um, my personal favorite Roman story of necromancy concerns um, uh, a battle during which the general's son goes out to consult this witch named Erichtho. And he wants to know if uh, his dad, Pompey the Great, is going to win this battle or not. And the, the description of the witch is unbelievable. I mean, it is <coughs> as gory and as graphic as any modern horror story. Um, and the Romans obviously were known for being a little bit barbaric and bloodthirsty at times, but this thing is incredible. So the, the witch tells him how she goes about calling forth a spirit to consult on this. And it's this insane thing like sucking out the eyes of a corpse and uh, <laughs> wow, it's crazy and it's very long. Um, it's well worth a read. It's part of um, an epic poem, I think, called Pharsalia. So if you ever want to look that up, look up a Rick the Witch and just read this absolutely crazy description of necromancy the way the Romans saw it. <laughs> And did they actually, did she give them some kind of a, what she thought was going to happen in the battle? Like, that's my other question. I was like, did she actually tell them what she thought was going to happen after they did all this? Well, theoretically, she did. Um, I, there, there's a similar story in the Bible. The, the story of Saul going to see the witch of Endor to ask yep. if he's going to win this great battle. And she tells him, you're going to lose. And he does yeah. lose. And, um, actually, she doesn't tell him. The spirit she summons up of Samuel... Yeah. Prophet yeah. tells it. So yeah, this I throughout history you do have these stories of these necromancers or witches who are correct in prophesying the future. Um, yep. You know, obviously we don't know whether any of that is true at this point. Yeah, that's my thing. Is can you imagine if you went through all that and then they were wrong? Like, <laughs> 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 right. so. I know the Roman emperors employed necromancers, I saw in your mm -hmm. book. Uh, my thing is, so back then, if they believed in witches, I know, I, I don't know about during the Roman times, but you always hear about people getting killed for being witches back in like the, the medieval age. So were these people back then, were, would Roman society kill these people if they knew they existed or were they kind of more open to it? or? It, it kind of depends at what point in the, the Roman the evolution of the Roman Empire you were. Yeah. By the time yeah. the, the Christian emperors came in, um, they started to really, really crack down on any practice yep. of magic. The no-go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but what was interesting was that at the same time they were cracking down on it, they were amassing the libraries of these spell books, and they were keeping them locked away, but monks were researching them. And you occasionally get these very interesting tales of a monk who has decided to delve into necromancy and um, mm -hmm. some of them ended up facing charges of heresy and yeah. facing the Inquisition. And yeah, it's um, yeah, there were occasionally their own their own believers were seduced by these old books. Yeah, because that's what I was wondering. I was like, so did they kind of look past it because you're helping out the emperor and he kind of like protected them in a sense? Because I always thought that you would get killed doing that kind of thing back then. Like I said, it kind of depends on what stage you're at in the empire. Yeah. So I know I'm going to say this wrong, but I know. Is it Hilarius and Patricius? They were on trial for consulting an oracle about the fate of an emperor. And in your book, you were saying that that's either the earliest or one of the earliest re uh, records of a talking board, like an Ouija board. They had a very primitive form of the talking board, and the, the talking board is, in its most basic sense, is just a, a, a platform or a board or a table or whatever that's laid out with things yeah. that you can, a spirit can conceivably point at and, and spell out messages. Um, it, Of course, in the 19th century, we get it patented as the Ouija board, but they existed yeah. long before that. <laughs> Do, uh, do you know what actually is the oldest Ouija board or talking board that you know that's like in a museum or in someone's collection? I'm just curious because I, I I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it is very cool. Yeah, I'm not sure what the actual oldest one is. Um, mm -hmm. There's an incredible place online called the Museum of Talking Boards, mm -hmm. and 
they have a lot of interesting histories there. I I would guess the earliest that I've heard of might be something like 1860, and they there was a weird sort of um, version of them for a while that was popular about that time that was just a pencil that was stuck through the planchette, and yeah. as the planchette moved, the pencil wrote a message. That was a sort of weird variant hmm. of them that was popular for a while, but um, back in 1848, which is when the seance really begins with the Fox sisters, they were actually at some of their seances were cutting out little slips of paper and just putting them on a table. And then they would point to each letter and ask the spirits to rap whenever they hit yeah. the right letter. And of course, this took forever to spell out a, a very simple <laughs> yeah. message. Wow. You were going to ask a question, Nick. It sounded like I interrupted you. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, um, going back to the Bible, was casting lots, when they talk about casting lots in the Bible, was that a form of divination? I am not totally sure about oh, okay. that. That's yeah, that's a little outside of my biblical expertise. Oh. Um, as far as writing something. Um, so my next thing I was wondering. So, do you know as far as like Egypt, Greece, Rome, Mesopotamia? Do you know who was technically like as far as you know who was the first? Who were the first ones to practice this kind of stuff? It would have been the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the, the sort of um, people who were in the, the Tigris-Euphrates River, the, the mm -hmm. cradle of civilization, mm -hmm. as it's often called. And I mean, this this stuff was there right from the beginning of civilization. Mm -hmm. Yep, because so, they always like it always goes along with the whole. We always wonder what life after death is. Yeah. Right. So is there like a difference between what they were doing with that at the time? Or were they all kind of trying to do the same thing, like read the future, ask some kind of an entity to do something for them? Was it all kind of the same thing? or It was a little bit the same thing. Uh, people have always certainly been curious about the afterlife and have often mm -hmm. tried to uh, consult spirits to find out what that was like or people seeking closure with a loved one. That's always been around. Yeah. The things that have changed a little bit over the centuries are that um, in the past, it was always performed on a solo basis. It was usually yeah. something you had to do by yourself, um, whether you were the magician or someone who had been advised by a magician. You would mm -hmm. often encounter the spirit in a dream. That was very common and much more, I think, accepted than it probably is now. Um, yeah. And... Uh, it was often involving um, the fact that the spirit's burial rites had not been properly observed. That was a big thing, especially mm -hmm. back in the ancient Greek days. Um, we have, for example, the whole story of Achilles and Patroclus, who they were best friends. Patroclus dies in the Trojan War. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get a proper burial, so he kind of comes back to haunt Achilles' dreams until he gets that proper burial. Mm -hmm. And that was a really common thing. Again, that's not something that you almost ever encounter now with hauntings. Yeah. One thing that came to my mind was um, they say that, was it Leonidas before the battle with the 300 against Xerxes? Mm -hmm. They were saying they supposedly saw an oracle before that all happened? There, there like, used to be the oracles of Delphi, which were yeah. the priest, sort of the priestesses committed to Apollo, and they could supposedly perform all kinds of prophecy and so forth. They were not so much associated with calling up the dead yeah. but um yeah. yeah they were often consulted before battles and my next thing let's see so i was listening to one of the interviews that you did you were talking about the celtics and the norsemen like the norway mm -hmm. like the nordic countries and you were saying that they have they did actual human sacrifices with this with these rituals i guess you would call them or you said that was one of the earliest you know about that kind of stuff going on well, the ancient Celt tribes, there's there's been a little bit of debate over how much sacrifice, human sacrifice, they engaged in. And there, there is archaeological evidence to support that they definitely did it. Um, yeah. But yeah. whether they did it in some sort of um, uh, sort of vindictive sense, were they sacrificing prisoners or was it a more of a thing where they would choose from within their own tribe during <laughs> yeah. a drought or um, mm -hmm. a bad harvest or something? 
there was a really interesting book that was written um, about 30 years ago about an archaeological dig where they uncovered a Celtic prince and they thought he was probably sacrificed during a time when they'd had like three years of bad harvest and they found this tiny little bit of burnt cake in his stomach that indicated he had probably gotten the little piece that whoever got that was the sacrificial mm, yeah system. so yeah they did religion sacrifice now whether that had anything to do with any form of necromancy there's so little we know about the celts because they didn't leave any written records yeah. mm -hmm. so, don't they have like those bog men they call them from like as Ireland or Scotland where they think that they were some kind of sacrifice of some kind? Maybe, but they, I think, come later than most of the Celtic tribes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Didn't you look into that, Nick? The bog people? Um, a little bit. It's been a while since I've looked into that. Um, <clears throat> I don't, they may have been sacrificed from what I've read. Uh, the Celts and the uh, Mesoamerican civilizations mostly would just do that to prisoners of war, from what I've read. So that's the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, before, I just uh, oh. yeah. What's what's that, Tim? Oh, I was gonna say, and I know in like ancient Egypt too, the priests consulted with like necromancy to try to because obviously in the next world they would thought the pharaoh and them would be coming back in the next life. I know they always tried to preserve the body. They thought they would possibly come back being reincarnated as a gods and whatnot. So, like, goes another prove another civilization. Oh yeah. So, um, let's see. So, so I'm looking through my notes here. So, how often would they do these rituals back then? Like, does anybody know, or was it just once in a while, or was it something that someone would do like every day, like? That was kind of like that's I wouldn't call it a job, but like something that they were really into, or yeah, rituals in terms of sacrifice, or in terms like a of necromancy of rituals, and just like in general. Back then, it was usually to achieve a very specific goal. Um, it was less a religious observance and more a goal-oriented thing. I yeah. want to find out where this treasure is located. I want to stop these droughts we've been having. So I don't think it was necessarily like a common or regular practice. And were those, were the people, were the, I call them necro, necromancers, were they seen as important people back in society back then? Or were they, they kind of just blend in with everyone else? They were way on the outside. Um, I They were often living under the shadow of um, punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, even true. some of them became later on as you kind of start to wind down out of the whole witch hunting period um, and people are not being executed by the thousands anymore you get uh, the first few of them who become kind of superstars yeah uh, you get john d and edward kelly and you get um the Cagliostro, these people who are traveling the great courts of Europe and are entertaining kings and queens, but um, mm -hmm. when they run into trouble is when their acts don't go well. Um, yeah. And we have the story of, um, for example, uh, Cagliostro, I think it is, winds up in like a prison um, yeah. when it kind of runs out of great tricks. Oh, yeah. So before we kind of move a little bit further ahead in the timeline, as far as like starting in the, as far back as your book starts working our way forward to nowadays, um, I thought this was very interesting. You kind of mentioned this in your book. So have archaeologists ever found any of these old sites? I know you mentioned one was from 1958. They said that they found one that was pretty cool. Well, they, they are, there's always some debate over these. For example, the famous cave um, that is mentioned in the, uh, the Odyssey, where Odysseus goes to perform this rite to resurrect the spirit of Tiresias, mm -hmm. um, is supposed to be on the shores of Lake, and I don't know how to pronounce this either, Acheron or Acheron. Yeah. Um, and they think they may have actually found this cave. And for a while, they were quite certain they had found it. They had found this remarkable place in that area that had all this underground um, rooms and, and 
then they ended up deciding, oh, it was actually just a sort of jail. <laughs> it was not yeah. a legendary place. But so there's always kind of a debate over whether they've actually found some of the most important of these sites or not. There's also a cave that is mentioned in one of the stories of Hercules or Heracles mm -hmm. in, in which he descends, he uses this cave to descend into the underworld. And again, they mm -hmm. think they have found the cave which of, of course does not actually descend into the underworld, yeah, yeah. but there's always a little bit of debate on those things. Absolutely. Oh yes, sir. Our chat room says. Oh, never mind. He's kind of making a statement. So my next thing was so I don't know how to say is it uh, Phantoms Magoria or how do you say it? Phantoms Magoria? How do you say that? Phantasmagoria. Phantasmagoria. So can you describe what that is in general terms? And we'll kind of go into a little bit more detail on that. That's something that comes along. That is kind of what we might call these days a magic lantern. It was a sort of very early slide projector. Um, yeah. And it was something that was used to entertain audiences. But people, it was a apparently so startling to many people that they thought they were actually seeing ghosts and monsters and so forth. It was a projection oh, yeah. of a series of slides that showed etchings and engravings of spirits. And, and um, they could even do things like move the slides back and forth in the projector to make it look like these things were moving out towards people. And people would apparently panic and flee at times. And it didn't <laughs> help that they were also holding, they held a, these performances, I think, started outside of Paris. And I think it's hmm. the 18th century. And people, they're holding them in, in graveyards to further add to this oh, dang, um, yeah. atmosphere. <laughs> and they were apparently very, very effective. So how long did they do those for before they got to like the spook shows and all that stuff further on down the line? They were around for a while. They kind of transformed through the 19th century into more of the magic show. And eventually by the late 19th century, you're getting things like the Pepper's Ghost Illusion with the, the two-way glass that can be tilted and you can stand in a room and look through it and you look like you're seeing a ghost if you're oh, yeah. standing in a place. And, so, yeah, it, it sort of just transforms throughout the um, 19th century. And, of course, eventually in the 20th becomes movie special effects. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So when they would do these shows, did they did the people know that this was just them putting on a show? Or did they think that this was real at the time? Or how was it advertised, I guess, in a sense? Like, did they say, like, we're going to go talk to some dead people, come out here to go see it? Or, like, how would they... How would they get people to come in and how would they advertise this? The the presentation was very theatrical. It was not presented as this is going to be a trick that you're going to love. It was presented as we are going to bring up the spirits. And most people yeah. knew what was going on, you know, but there apparently were people who occasionally just panicked. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's see so that turned into the spook shows you were saying like eventually i guess that was kind of the precursor to the spook show so what's the difference between that and a spook show is it kind of the same thing just like a different spook time for time yeah spook shows were big in the the sort of mid to uh well the middle of the 20th century for a while they weren't around all that long which is too bad because i would love to see one in person they sound so fun they were oh yeah they were thing that gave the stage magicians of the early part of the 20th century work because by the time the movies mm -hmm. came in, they put a lot of the stage magicians out of out of business and those magicians started to discover that there was this whole alternative thing they could do where they could make their acts much spookier and even a little yeah. bit bloodier and they could take them on the road with the traveling horror movie <laughs> um, because this is back in the day before we had 5,000 multiplexes and and, oh, yeah. it. and and they would travel the print around and these ghost shows would go with the print and sometimes they were even tied in directly to the movie but usually it was a stage magician who would present a show that would involve some sort of variance on magic it, it like I said might be a little bloodier when he did sawing his assistant in half there might be real blood involved and yeah. it would typically end with the lights going out in the theater and then they would 
fly phosphorescent things over the, the heads of the audience, um, ghost on wires. They would throw little um, balls of phosphorescent paper and so forth out into the audience. And that would go on for a few minutes. And then that was the big climax of the show. So how when how long roughly did those go for? Was it like 50 years, you'd say, or... For some reason, I don't know why in my head I was thinking like from like Civil War time until like the 19 World War II or something is what I was thinking. The real spook shows were strictly limited to that sort of period of movie exhibition, which kind of goes from around maybe 1930 up until the 60s. And then in the, in yeah. the 60s, they kind of die out. No, I didn't. And then, um, let's see, so you said they stopped in the 1960s, 60s, I can't talk today. Is there any certain famous ones that stand out, or do you know if there's, like, any kind of cool advertisements you could, like, if I wanted to go search it to see, look at it, or? There are. I actually have a collection of ghost show booklets, which I don't have near me, or I'd grab them and hold That's them off. Cool. It yeah. is cool. They actually put out little like guides on how to do it yourself back then. And, mm -hmm. um, if you can find those, they're really fun to read. And um, they, um, the, the, there are still people kind of doing them now as novelty acts. I have friends, for example, here in LA who recently put on a theater production that was essentially a modern ghost show. And uh, they cool, actually yeah. borrowed my, my vintage pamphlets and took tips out of them on the effects and so forth. That's pretty cool. So uh, you said the pamphlets kind of, is it like a program for the show or is it just kind of like, is it kind of like its own thing where it describes like what they were doing and how they do it or. These are how to do it. Yeah. These are, these are not something they would like sell or hand out at the show to the audience. Did they sell things at those shows? Like, I don't know. I wouldn't call them a souvenir, but I guess they're kind of souvenirs. If they did, I have never seen much of it. Um, I think sometimes the movies might have sold things or might have, for example, oh, the star will be attending the screening today yeah. and you can get an autograph picture, that kind of thing. But hmm. the spook shows didn't seem to do much in the way of merch. Oh, yeah. My next thing I have on here, it says... You kind of mentioned this. I wrote, you said that they were precursors to modern-day horror movies. That's right up oh. your alley. Jeremy oh, loves yeah. horror movies, too. <laughs> we all do. Oh. Yeah. So how far did the shows go? Was it just like a United States thing, or was this kind of like a European thing, too? Or uh, the If we're talking like the Phantasmagorianas, um, mm -hmm. or Phantasmagorias, those um, started in Europe, came over to the UK and the US later on, um, but by the time they ended up in the States, we were getting close to the first movies. And by the time you could go into a theater and see a, a Georges Méliès movie or a Thomas Edison's Frankenstein, it was mm -hmm. pretty much that was what you wanted to see, not this passe um, slide projection act. Yeah. And then, let's see. So you kind of mentioned this. So, but... You said that there's not very many of these modern day shows that they hold as uh, novelty shows. You said that there's only just a few that you know of. Yeah, I like I said, I think they're all probably like local theater yeah. productions. I've heard of a few, but um, nothing that was like a traveling show. And so we're going to forward a little bit to spiritualism. Can you talk a little bit about the Fox sisters? And I know they're the kind of the original group, I guess, like the famous, more famous group. Can you talk a little bit about them? Oh, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of the Fox sisters. Um, they were these teenage girls in 1848 who were living in this old farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere near Rochester, New York. And it was yeah. Kate and Maggie were the two girls who were living with their parents. Um, the Foxes also had three growing children who were not living in the house at the time, including sister Leah, who did live in Rochester. And Leah plays an important part in this later on. But in 1848, they started hearing weird sounds coming from around this old farmhouse. And they were these knocking sounds and, and everyone heard them. And the girls ended up saying they're spirits and we have figured out a way to communicate with them. And 
um, they could ask the spirits rap once for yes, rap twice for no, that kind of thing, and they would get these mm -hmm. answers. And this caught on and got out, and within weeks there were hundreds of people showing up at this farmhouse to oh, yeah. witness this. Wow. And uh, this is where Leah comes in. Leah saw a way to make money. She was a music teacher who was living in Rochester, and she brought the girls, Kate and Maggie, to stay with her, and she started charging yeah. for their seances and and so people would come to leah's house they would come into her dining room they would a group of say 12 to 15 would sit around her big dining room table with kate and maggie acting as the mediums and they would witness these supposed miracles and at that point it involved knockings and it involved something called table tipping um which was that the table would kind of bump around and <laughs> tip a little bit during these seances mm -hmm. yeah so did were they one of the main ones that the debunkers were kind of trying to chase after to debunk them at one point oh yes and they debunked them very early on um and it didn't matter uh, they were debunked by, I think, 1852, and, and they were tested by some scientists who discovered that the, the spirit rapping noises were actually <laughs> the girls cracking their toe knuckles. They apparently oh, had to, yeah. to, wow. to crack their toe knuckles yeah. in such a way that it was like ear shattering and could be heard all over a big auditorium. And, and oh, Leo, wow. Even Leah said, I can't do it. It was a genetic thing that was just with the two girls. And even though they were debunked early on, they became massive superstars. Um, and yeah. they were the model for all of the mediums that followed. And there were thousands uh, within oh, just yeah. a few years. There were thousands of mediums in both the U.S. and the U.K. who were kind of copying um, the model that the Fox sisters created. Now, uh, I didn't have a chance to read your book, but did you um, go over like Leafy Anderson? Does that name strike a... I a sure book? did. I, I am absolutely impressed and fascinated by Mother Leafy Anderson. Yeah, she she was a, an amazing figure, um, a black spiritualist. Um, and she comes around kind of in the end of the 19th century, and she sets up the first black spiritualist church, which ends up becoming a sort of network of black spiritualist churches. And there were some great stories about her. She was arrested early on and charged with fraud, and she got out of the charge by uh, telling things to the judge that he couldn't, he said she could not possibly have known these things. Um, so yeah, she's a really interesting figure. So, hmm. um, so Daniel Douglas was the other one I thought was interesting. He's kind of one of the original famous mediums. Can you talk a little bit about him? Yeah, Daniel Douglas Hume. His um, last name is actually H U M E. Um, he was a Scottish American medium who is often considered to be the, the greatest of them all. Um, he grew up um, mainly in America with an aunt. He, when he heard about the Fox sisters, he started copying some of what they were doing when he was very young. He was apparently very gifted at mediumship. He became a star very quickly. He traveled to Great Britain in, I think, the 1850s, something like that, and he became an absolute superstar there. And he was performing for all of the lords and the ladies, and he actually traveled continental Europe performing for kings and queens. And he wow. was not universally loved. Um, one of the people who most famously did not like him was the poet Robert Browning, who attended yeah. one of his seances with his wife, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And Elizabeth apparently was quite impressed by Hume, but Robert, not so much. He wrote, a, in fact, an absolutely disastrous poem called Mr. Sludge, the Medium, which is a thinly veiled attack on Hume. And he claimed that Hume would do things like uh, during the seance, slip his feet out of his shoes and then lift his legs up under the table and touch people's legs and then claim yeah. that the spirits were touching them. And mm -hmm. he was also mm -hmm. famous for his ability to levitate. 
And his most famous um, effect or presentation took place in, I think it's 1872. It was called the Ashley House Levitation. And this mm -hmm. was spectacular. This made all of the papers at the time. He was staying with uh, two English member, members of the royalty noblemen who claimed that during the evening's presentation, they saw him float up out of his chair, out through the window of a, I think a third story window, in through the window of another room and back into his chair. Um, mm -hmm. And this, uh -huh. this particular description has been debated for decades. Ever since people are still trying to figure out exactly how he did it, what happened that night. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most spectacular events in the entire history of spiritualism. Uh, that's what I was thinking. That's pretty mm. cool. So was there like a big audience that saw this, like a crowd or? No, it was just three men. Um, there were two English lords yeah. and then one of them had a cousin who was in the room. And But they all talked about it to the newspapers uh, within the, the week following the event. And yeah. so because cool. it was all these lords and was in the newspapers and so forth that became quite famous. So is that kind of like his most famous thing that he's ever done? Was that, would you say? That levitating that was thing? Very, that was very famous. He also, he wrote a number of books. He wrote an autobiography. Um, he, he was also involved with a kind of an amusing case. Uh, there was a an older woman who had no children who decided to make him her heir when he was sort of, I think, even middle-aged almost. And he um, <laughs> he changed his name briefly to her name, and she, she be bequeathed him 20,000 pounds, which, of course, was oh, yeah. incredible. Yeah, in yeah that's a lot of money. <laughs> and this wow. was after he one of his claims to fame was that he never accepted money from people well he did accept gifts like this mm -hmm. and then she ends up of like a year after she does this she ends up deciding he's absolutely a fraud and she takes all the money back and he changes <laughs> back to him, so. Hmm. so this is this one i thought was interesting so uh, Helen Duncan, can you talk about her a little bit with the ectoplasm? She's my, yeah, yeah, she's my favorite medium. My personal favorite of every everybody I write about in the book is Helen Duncan. She's a 20th century medium. She's not in the 19th century. And she became very, very famous in Great Britain in 1944 when she went on trial. And the reason she went on trial was that a few years earlier, she had correctly named a British battleship that was sunk in a battle in World War II, and no one was supposed to know yet when she named this ship. The, the, it was still a secret. They hadn't made it public yet. And she gave a seance where she uh, gave out the name of the ship, and there was a British, happened to be a British intelligence agent at that seance, and he came back and reported this. So they were watching her from that point on and um, kind of looking for a reason to arrest her. and and. Some of the uh, British police went to one of her seances, claimed that they had her red-handed in fraud. They did not, but it went to trial anyways. It went to trial at the top court in England, and it was so such a huge deal that it actually eclipsed war coverage at the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Churchill, who was writing notes to his ministers going, what is this thing? this trial with this, this medium. And she, it was also spectacular because she was tried under a 1735 witchcraft act. Um, they had no other law they could try her under apparently. So they tried her under a 1735 <laughs> witchcraft law. And even though there was, it turned out there was no concrete proof. There was just a couple of policemen who had been to one of her seances and um, they found her guilty and gave her the maximum sentence, which was six yeah. months of labor in, in one of their prisons. And um, after that, they did at least do away with that 1735 witchcraft law. And they actually did enact instead a fraudulent mediums law, um, mm -hmm. which I think is still on the books in Great Britain. Wow. So was she one of the last ones to ever get in trouble for that as far as get like a 
get sent to prison or jail for something within the, within the spiritual realm, well, in the spiritual realm, like doing that kind of stuff? Well, she was certainly the last one, I think, under that 1735 Witchcraft Act. But uh, there were, I think, a lot of people who may have been arrested under the Fraudulent Mediums Act, but they were not like big sensational trials like hers was. She was she was also interesting because she was studied way back in the 20s by a very famous psychic investigator named Harry Price. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he studied her because he was interested in her claimed ability to produce ectoplasm, which is this supposed to be this material of the spirits that mediums can produce. And it it would look like in a darkened room, you would look at the medium and you would see this sort of filmy white material emerging from them and often from their mouth or from their nose or yeah. even out of their torso or something. And Harry Price studied her at length and ended up uh, concluding that she had the amazing ability to regurgitate at will. Um, oh, and he, he believed that she, before seance, she would go in and swallow a bunch of cheesecloth and mm -hmm. then regurgitate that at will. And in a darkened room, you would indeed see this white stuff coming out of her that looked very strange. Yeah. So he yeah. got some really bright photographs <laughs> of her. I think she had not been told that she was going to be subjected to flash photography. And you can see it is very clearly a length of cheesecloth that's coming out of oh, her. Oh, they got pictures of it? I didn't know they had pictures of it. Wow. But yeah, go see these. They're, they're pretty strange. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> Well, so, I see another name that's oh, that brought up with like the ectoplasm is Eva Carrieri. Uh huh. She was another medium that was studied extensively by the Society for Psychical Research, which was the sort of um, first real organization of people who investigated psychic phenomenon. They started in 1882 in Great Britain. They spread very quickly to the U.S. And Eva Carrier was one of the big um, mediums that they investigated. They also investigated a really interesting Italian medium named Eusepia Palladino. And she was one who um, some of the investigators actually thought she was the real deal. She was um, one of the ones who seemed to be harder to disprove. Oh, dang. Cool. So let's see, was how many of the I don't know what you want to call them. We call them a medium or some individuals in the spiritualism uh, and historically with spiritualism. How many of them actually talked about ectoplasm or said that they could produce it? Or was she kind of Helen, Helen kind of the only one that could, that made that claim? The spiritualist mediums kind of went through stages. Um, when they first started, they kind of followed the Fox sisters model and they did these very simple presentations of calling out and asking the spirits to answer questions and yeah. the table would tilt and you'd hear the rappings. And then as it moves forward through the second half of the 19th century, it starts to take on some interesting um, mm -hmm. characteristics. You get mediums who specialize in particular things. There was a guy named Dr. Henry Slade who specialized in slate writing. And this was a thing where you'd have a little blackboard and messages would supposedly appear on it. Or you might have a medium who specialized in something called a ports, which yeah, was yeah. the spirits would suddenly produce objects in the middle of the seance. Or you'd have Hume and the levitation. And by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, a lot of the mediums have been debunked and they're kind of looking for even more radical things. And you get at that point, you're getting full body apparitions, manifestations yeah. of spirits, and you're getting this ectoplasm. And then hmm. in the early part of the 20th century, they all get debunked. And at that point, you kind of move into the trance medium because the trance medium is much harder to debunk. Um, there is no physical evidence involved. All you can say is, well, wait a minute, but Uncle Ronnie said his favorite color was red and you just said blue. That's That really is the only way you can truly debunk a lot of the trance mediums. So mm -hmm. that became much more popular than the um, physical mediums. Makes sense. Yeah. Are there any of these early shows or any certain medium that's you kind of said a minute ago, any certain one that stand out to you as interesting or maybe I don't know if you named them all in your book, the ones that you thought were interesting or is there any other ones? 
that, that the really other, yeah. yeah, there's one other one I really like. I really like Florence Cook. Um, and I find Florence mm -hmm. Cook very interesting for a couple of reasons. She's around in the late 19th century in, in London. She starts as a very young teenager. She was apparently fairly pretty. She, I mean, we have photos of her. Yeah, she's, she's pretty. You could see she would be very charismatic. We can guess she was probably a somewhat flamboyant performer. And what, what I find interesting about Florence, Florence um, goes on to get tested by a very famous scientist named William Crookes, who would go on to be knighted. He is a major figure in the history of chemistry in particular. He was also an, uh, an absolutely ardent spiritualist who believed in this stuff like crazy. And he tested people like Daniel Douglas Hume and Florence Cook and pronounced all of them to be genuine. Um, mm -hmm. Now, afterwards, Florence, many years later, confessed to people that she had an affair with Crooks. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the whole case of Florence is interesting to me because I think she shows that being a medium was an absolutely interesting and viable alternative to a young woman who was stuck in Victorian society and yeah. maybe didn't want to be a housewife or a domestic servant in a big household or a factory worker. Um, she could become a medium if she was flamboyant and gifted enough at doing this kind of work and um, mm -hmm. it seemed to work for some of these women. So can you talk about the spirit of Katie King with Florence? <laughs> Lawrence Cook and William Crook, sorry about that. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Every one of the, the mediums of this time, and we're talking now like the 1860s, 1870s, they all had these spirit guides. And for some reason, many of them called their spirit guide Katie King. It was this this name that comes up over and over and over in the mediums. And um, Flor Florence said that her spirit guide was Katie King. And she ends up, um, she's one of the people who ends up saying that she can manifest the spirit of Katie King at her seances. And she does this during a seance by going into something that was called a spirit cabinet. And this was popular at a lot of the seances. It was sometimes an actual cabinet, like a big standing free wardrobe that a medium would go into. But quite often it was just a curtained off side room. Um, yeah. And the medium would go into this area and it would be shut off from the eyes of the participants. And, you know, the light level is already very low. We're talking the gas light era. They would turn the gas down. So it's just almost pitch black, just the tiniest bit of illumination. And after a few minutes, a spirit would suddenly appear um, emerging from the cabinet. And the spirit of Katie King happened to bear an astonishing resemblance to Florence Cook. <laughs> Um, yeah. would emerge in this white outfit with this big veil and this robe and um, and she would move among the participants at the seance and the reason that no one ever doubted this was that there was this idea that if you got up and broke the seance and went over to look in the spirit cabinet you would endanger the life of the medium so no yeah. one wanted to do that now, what was really amazing about this was that um, William Crooks is holding these seances at his house and he is documenting them on photography, very early photography. But nonetheless, we have photos of Crooks arm in arm with this spirit of King. Yeah. And again, it is very obviously Florence. Um, and you have to wonder how Crooks if he was actually in on it, if he was bamboozled, if he was so in love with her, he went along with it. It's really, at the time, he was accused of laying his reputation on the line, which certainly he did. Um, he diverged from it unscathed. He went on like 30 years later to be knighted and is a major figure in, in British science history. But his sort of credulity in believing that this obvious <laughs> Katie King slash you know, spirit guide was not Florence it yeah. is kind of baffling even now. So did the photos kind of turn people off to the whole Katie King deal or where it kind of made, got them more popular? Well, what's funny is that Crooks tried to destroy them all later on, but some of them had been published and yeah, they, yeah. uh, 
kind of emerged much later on when someone produced them from when they had been published. And so what we have, are, they're kind of, you know, scratchy. I mean, they were not the greatest quality to begin with, given what photography was like at the time. But they're, they're, they're clear enough that you see what's going on. Yeah. Um, it's kind of telling, too, that Crooks later on tried to destroy these photos. Yeah. So my other thing I was wondering is you mentioned that there's like a spirit cabinet and you said multiple uh, multiple mediums used kind of this idea. So did anyone ever catch anyone messing with this? Go, like anyone in there kind of caught them? They have oh, yeah. Caught them oh, yes. Um, the, uh, there was a rival medium to Florence named Agnes Guppy. And yeah. Agnes was apparently a bit of a nasty woman, and, and she actually got someone to break the circle during one of Florence's seances and go over and rip the curtain away to reveal that Florence indeed was not there. Um, yeah. Uh, at which point everyone realized that it was Katie King. And yet these constant um, exposures and debunkings never seem to stop people from believing in some of these mediums. One of my favorite stories about that is there was a rivalry between two mediums in Boston. And the one medium says, she gives an interview one day and she says, look, I can do everything that she can do and I can prove that she's a fraud by showing that they're all tricks. Now, you would think the obvious response to that is, okay, then show us. No, the, the spiritualism response to that was, okay, wait a minute, we know she's genuine. So if you can do everything that she can do, that means you're genuine too. Oh, dang, yeah. Mm. It's just like this head-twisting pretzel logic that they engaged in. Yeah. So with as far as the spirit cabinet goes, so um, would the... I'm trying to think, would the medium tell the audience they're going back there? Like, did they make it obvious they were going back there, or did they kind of just disappear one minute and then everyone's wondering where they went, or...? Oh yeah, no, they it was all part of the thing and it was it people knew it was going to happen in advance and in fact there were um there were acts who based their entire séance performance on a spirit uh, a spirit cabinet. There were um mm -hmm. two famous brothers who toured um the UK and Europe and so forth and uh, the Davenport brothers. And they were essentially stage magicians who found that it was far more lucrative to act as medium. Yeah. And they had, their, their um, shtick consisted of going to auditoriums rather than like a living room or something. And they had their own little cabinet that looked like a, like I said, a freestanding wardrobe thing. Oh yeah. And they would go into the cabinet at the beginning of the performance and they're in front of a large audience and the doors to the cabinet are shut. And within a few minutes, things start happening like um, musical instruments floating up out of the cabinet and over the heads of the audience and playing and spirit hands emerging from parts of the cabinet. Well, of course, the cabinet was just a large piece of magic equipment that they had rigged in advance. And they got debunked really badly. They got they started a riot at one city where they played and the spirit cabinet was destroyed. They had to flee town in a oh, really yeah. So do when mm. people would find out that they weren't legit, like for instance, like Florence was caught, like you were saying, did people kind of go crazy and want their money back or want to, did they have to run out of town? Like you were saying, cause they, they got embarrassed or. I've never heard of people asking for their money back. I mean, there were people who would come out of these seances and, and would say, well, that was poppycock or that was nonsense or it was just trickery or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, it was interesting that sometimes those same people would say, but I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. the, the spiritualist seances were really interesting. They were, they were much different, I think, from what we think of as a seance today, because we're mm -hmm. so programmed by like horror movies Yeah, and we think they're going to be these terrifying things. Well, back then they were really fun. They were like one part party, one part revivalist meeting, one part magic show. And, and you read accounts from people who attended them at the time, and they will say things like, it was the most magical night of my life. It was the They most sound important. really fun, actually. Sounds cool yeah. to see one of those, if you could. Yeah, I'm exactly. actually looking at them right now in another tab. They look the Davenport Brothers. Uh, did yeah. you want me to share your screen, Tim? 
Sure, yeah. I was going to say, if you want to see so people can see what it looked like. Let me see if I can make that bigger for you. Um, I think that's about as big as I could get it right there. So what are we looking at right there? That is um, that, in oh, their sorry. spirit cabinet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, that's interesting. I had to look, see what it looked like. Yeah. Well, that is pretty cool. And you will notice that the spirit cabinet is set up on trestles. Um, mm -hmm. That was supposedly so the audience could see underneath it. So they could see there was nobody underneath it who was manipulating things. And Yeah. So let me see. The next one that I have, I only have like a couple. I think this is the last specific psychic. I, psychic. The last specific medium I have questions about. Then it kind of goes into other things. So, um, Emma Harding, uh, was it, I think it was on a show that you were on. I don't recall if it was in your book. They were saying that spiritualists were going to make good, they would make good soldiers in the military if they were, if they were to join. <laughs> yeah. she, Emma Harding was a, a writer and a spiritualist. And, um, she thought that ardent spiritualist believers would make great soldiers because they would be in touch with the other side and they wouldn't. Yeah fear death as much because they knew that there was existence beyond death and yeah she she wrote a quite a piece about that it's um a really strange and interesting work did tim and nick did you guys have any questions about any of the specifics uh mediums that we were talking about before we go on to like a different topic on here oh no i was just actually looking up the davenport brothers still <laughs> and then yeah, another tab. Yeah, very interesting yeah i was sitting there reading about it you have any questions, Nick? Real quick, before we go on to the next. No, I. Uh, I was just looking at stuff like Tim looking at the pictures of. Oh, this is a very interesting topic. I yeah, like. Yeah, I love yeah. it. So, my next thing was kind of about part of your book where you talk about modern seances. So, do we are modern seances in your opinion are they more entertainment or are they kind of practical? Like, do you think? In your opinion, people are really talking to ghosts or the dead, whatever you want to word that. Um, do we really even need them nowadays, in your opinion, or what? What do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I, I am, am often off asked if I am a believer in spirits and ghosts and mediums and so forth, and I, I always describe myself as the truest form of a skeptic which is that I am open to any real possibility. Um, I have been to seances. I've been around people who are sensitives, and I've been in paranormal investigations where things happened that were really strange, and quite often things would happen to someone sitting next to me. Um, I was in a dark room in the basement of the Stanley Hotel in Colorado when a good friend sitting next to me suddenly said something is touching me. Um, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that he believed he was being touched. Now, what that was, I don't know. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to say I believe it was spirits of the dead. Yeah. But when it comes to mediums, I know some mediums who I think are absolutely incredible people. I think they're very intuitive. They're very compassionate. I, I think mm -hmm. they absolutely believe what they're doing. They are completely in earnest um, because I've been around them too much and they are genuinely really decent people. So I don't believe they're all frauds. Yeah. And I believe they are experiencing something. I don't know what that is. Um, so I am, remain very interested in the whole subject because it is yep. such an interesting conundrum. See, I think we agree on the same page too. We we do think that some are legitimate. And yeah. So my thing I was wondering was, so have you ever used an Ouija board or have you ever messed around with any of that kind of stuff? I have, yeah. I, you know, I, I tend to, the Ouija board, I don't know, I, I do not believe it's some gateway to evil, as so many people do. Um, I am much more there of a believer in this sort of idiomotor response, which is yeah. the idea yeah. that you are making unconscious movements and that are controlling this planchette. But again, I don't rule out the possibility that something else is going on. Um but yeah, I, I do think the Ouija board has kind of a bad rap 
no pun intended. Yeah, intended. society in general, the media, you never heard of anyone playing with the Ouija board and getting good news right afterwards and nothing bad ever happens or they never find the love of their life and happy ever happy ending on the movies and things. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and yet yeah. people have actually gotten a lot of comfort from Ouija boards because in the um, when the Ouija boards came to popularity, it was in the wake of World War One. And Ouija boards were suddenly the way that you could be sitting at home crying over the loss of your son on some distant yeah. battlefield, and you could talk to him mm. with a Ouija board. You didn't have to go to a, a medium's house or pay this woman to come into your house or whatever. You could sit there with this board and believe that you were you were getting messages from your beloved brother or sister or husband or whatever, you know. So yeah, that's I a good point. Yeah. did bring some solace to people back then. One question I forgot to ask you, I know we need to take a step back real quick. When we're talking about the specific mediums that were famous in like the early 1900s and the 1800s, so did they come to your house to do these shows or did you have to kind of go to their house or were these even advertised or how did all that go? Either way, they uh, people like Hume, Dan, Daniel Dungo Hume, would... Um, typically be put up at a Lord's house for a period of time. Um, and they often didn't even have their own place. They would just go from patron to patron's house. Um, but there were also situations where you would go to the medium's place to engage in a seance. And quite often you would be lured to their house by these agents that they would have out on the streets who um <laughs> Had, often were referred to as John King. Again, we get this. Yeah, yeah. This, mm -hmm. yeah. And these guys were kind of like pimps who would be out on the street going, hey, you know, uh, if you'd like to come to a seance, I've got a great medium down the alley here. And um, So it could go either way. You could go to their house or they might come to yours. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. These are kind of all over the place, my questions. Now. So... What's your opinion on tarot cards? Again, I, tarot cards, I think, are absolutely gorgeous. So I collect decks just because I love the art on them. Um, I suspect they are just one more way of maybe opening your intuition. Um, mm -hmm. I have heard of, for example, writers use them to work past a writer's block. Or um, it's like... The, one of my favorite writers of all time was the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick used to use the I Ching, which is a sort of almost an Asian version of the tarot deck, um, to write some of his novels with. So I, I think they are a good deck is absolutely beautiful and is, like I said, can open up certain things in some people i don't know that i believe they are absolutely in touch with the future or spirits that are telling them secrets yeah so my next thing i thought this was interesting um on an interview that you did <clears throat> he said that some catholic church members saw necromancers in secret i guess this is going way back yeah. Or they kept the necromancers' books that they took away from the individuals that were supposed to be banned at that time. Yeah, that's what I was mentioning earlier, that, that you would have these um, libraries, secret libraries within the Catholic Church of these old grimoires, these spell yeah. books. And monks would be researching these and would sometimes go a little too far with the research and would end up in front of a, a court of the Inquisition on charges of heresy for reading these books. Do you know if the, any of those books are like in a museum or if anyone could go look at pictures of those online? Oh, the, some of them are easily available. Um, the um, the so, the um, gosh, the the, le the Goetia, the lesser and greater Goetia of Solomon. Um, you can get those just about anywhere. Um, mm. the Cornelius Agrippa, the threefold, I forget what the absolute title on that is, but um, yeah. you can find these things at even like archive.org or um, you can uh, get Very PDFs cool. on, online for free. Yeah, they've been reprinted for hundreds of years, and so they're pretty easy to find. So my next few questions are kind of about spiritualist debunkers. 
So uh, I know Houdini at one point turned into a spiritualist debunker because um, Sir Ar it had to do with Sir Arthur C C Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I couldn't say that the author that wrote Sherlock Holmes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite relationships in all of spiritualism. You have, on the one hand, Houdini, who was, of course, the great magician, who mm -hmm. was kind of um, wanted to be a believer in spiritualism because he was so devoted to his mother, who he referred to as his beloved mother, and it was really hard for him when she died. Um, and then on the other hand, you have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who, of course, is the creator of Sherlock Holmes, one of the most logical, rational characters in all of literature. And, and yet Doyle was an absolutely upset. He was obsessed with spiritualism and all kinds of odd topics. And these two men became really good friends for a while. They admired each other greatly. Um, Houdini loved writers and he had a huge library at his house. And he even had a little custom made velvet lined box that he kept his letters from Conan Doyle in. And um, they, really, they were really good friends until <laughs> the one summer that, and I think it's 1922, their families are vacationing together. And Conan Doyle says to Houdini one day, my wife has taken up mediumship and would like to hold a seance with you. So uh, Houdini and Conan Doyle and his wife all get together late one afternoon and Lady Doyle proceeds to engage in automatic writing, which is the idea that you would go into a trance state and a spirit would enter you and write through you. And she produces something like two dozen handwritten pages, which are supposedly from Houdini's mother. And he was absolutely outraged. Um, he was so hurt by this and because they were plainly not from his mother, as he noted later on, my mother didn't speak a word of English. These were all written in English. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it turned them in from really dear friends into absolute bitter enemies. Um, and the story of their rivalry at that point is really interesting too, because in 1924, Houdini writes what's kind of the debunker's Bible. Um, a book called A Magician Among the Spirits. And it goes on and long about all of the things he's seen mediums do mm -hmm. and how they did it. And, and he sent a copy of that to Conan Doyle. And Conan Doyle scrawled across the title page, a malicious book. <laughs> um, <laughs> after that, they would even go on rival lecture tours in the same city. It's like Wednesday night, it might be Conan Doyle standing in front of a huge crowd in an auditorium talking about how great spiritualism is. And the next night, it might be Houdini going, no, 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 it's all <laughs> bunk. It's, it's yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Nick, were you going to ask a question? Sorry, it looked like you were going to ask a question, and I think that I might have interrupted you. Oh, I was just going to say, um, based on what we've been talking about today, do you think that perhaps seances and mediumship practices could be almost therapeutic for people? I guess you got into that a little bit earlier. Is it, it just, like you said, it lets you get hold of your intuition and work things out somewhat. I was just going to see if the, you thought that would be a viable thing. <laughs> I, I think it can be. And this is this is where a really hardcore skeptic and I would part ways. The, the really hardcore skeptics believe there's no value whatsoever to mediums and to seances. I don't agree with that. Um, for example, when they had Helen Duncan's trial in 1944, her defense produced over... 25 people, something like that, witnesses who had been to her seances. And these people would testify that she had brought them to tears, that she had given them incredible bits of wisdom that they were using in their lives, that um, there was a wonderful story from one of the, the women who had attended a seance and Helen had supposedly produced the spirit of a great aunt who had been a silver collector. And the aunt said to her niece, um, there is no point in it. You can't take the silver with you when you die. Don't do that. Um, so people would, would come away from these events sometimes with just this tremendous sense of comfort and, and solace and uh, 
I've seen that happen with contemporary mediums too. And I think there definitely is a place for that when it is done in a way that is not either obviously fraudulent or obviously out to make the medium a huge buck. Yeah. We were talking about Houdini a little bit. Isn't there like some kind of a seance they hold every year on Halloween to try and contact Houdini? And there's like a story he told his wife, something about that, that if, I think it was 1936 that if he were to able to come back and prove that ghosts were real, if there was an afterlife that he would come to some seance or something like that. Yeah. He, uh, while he was still alive, uh, he told her, look, if I can, if it's possible to come back, I'm going to do it. And I am going to give you a phrase and only you will know this phrase. And if you ever hear a medium utter this phrase, you will know mm -hmm. that, um, it's true that it really is me. And the phrase was Rosabelle believe. And um, unfortunately, his wife, Bess, made the mistake of telling that phrase to some people. Yeah. And there was, there was a medium after Houdini's death who used the phrase. And there was like this 10 second thing where they all thought, oh, my God, it really is Houdini. And then some people dug it up and realized that she had given the phrase away. Um, so, mm. But they do still hold the say the Houdini seance every year um, on Halloween, and it is held, I think, still by the members of Houdini's family. And I, I know that recently they were doing it virtually. Um, during the pandemic, you could attend it virtually, and I think they're still doing that. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm <laughs> sneezing. Um, no, excuse me, sorry. But um, so when they had these debunkers trying to debunk these mediums and these spiritualists, did the spiritualists get like um, how did they feel about these groups trying to debunk them? Did they like this because they're they thought if they could get away with it that they're going to be the cool kid on the block, or were they kind of scared mm -hmm. thinking my career is over if this person finds me out to be a fraud? Or uh, how did they feel about these groups? Like were they inviting them to come, or did they kind of just show up? you kind of had to do your show they weren't inviting them but they were also not turning down invitations from the scientists who wanted to investigate them um they seemed to be arrogant enough to believe they were going to be able to fool these, these scientists and they almost never did <laughs> um, <laughs> they were debunked in so many ways um and there was actually um, a commission that studied the spiritualists for several years in the late 19th century. I think it was called the Habert Commission. Yeah, They yeah. brought out their report in 1886, and it was devastating. And for a while, people thought that report would be the end of spiritualism. But um, what kind of brought it back was World War I, um, because, again, people had this need to believe that they could contact the souls of loved ones who had disappeared in some other part of the world. And so spiritualism, mediumship, Ouija boards, they got a sense of closure from that. And then we kind of talked about this a little bit. What are a few of like the more odd tricks or some of the bizarre things that stand out that some of the mediums did? Like you talked about the one was able to regurgitate, one was cracking her knuckles on her toes. Are the, like, do you know of, uh, what are some of the more bizarre ones you heard of, or are those kind of it? Well, Hume, there there has been some speculation about how he did some of his levitations, and, and it's actually almost very funny. Um, he always would talk while he was doing these levitations. So you're in a dark room with him, and he's saying, I'm levitating, I'm moving out of my chair, I'm reaching the ceiling. Well, yeah. what he was doing was he he apparently was very skilled at removing his feet in a very stealthy manner from his shoes. So he would remove his feet from his shoes, stand, crouch on the chair that he was seated in, and then slowly stand up. Now in the darkness, all you see is you see just maybe his face moving upwards in this very, yeah. very dark room, while his voice is obviously also coming from this ascending Thing. And then there's also been quite often the mediums, and I don't know that Hume in particular did this, but quite often they would uh, there would be a mark on the ceiling after the seance, and they would say, well, that's where I floated up out of my chair, and I made a mark with this pen. 
they had telescoping rods that the pen was attached to. So again, you're in a dark room. They pull this thing out of a pocket. They extend it. They mark the ceiling and, yeah. and the light go up and they say, look, I, I floated up and did that. Um, they used phosphorescent paints that to create these glowing orbs that they again they would hide these things and then when the lights go down you produce this thing that's painted in this phosphorus and paint you can move it around the room people think it's a glowing spirit or an orb that's moving among above their heads um mm -hmm. and i have even there has even been speculation that they had secret pipes installed in the walls of some of their houses that would make groaning and moaning sounds and yeah uh, so yeah they engaged in any number of tricks there was also speculation that a traveling medium would the first thing they would do when they got into a new town was go to the newspaper's office ask to look at recent society page records and quite often those society pages would mention who was a spiritualist Hmm. So, you know, oh, I'm in town. This says Joe Blow and his wife Emma are spiritualists. That's where I'm going. Oh yeah. Did you? And I was reading in another tab actually too, Jerry. I was reading about um, ancient, like you know, the old photography of how they would do double exposures to make it look like spirits were behind them. Also, yeah, another trick too. I've seen some of those before. Yeah. You reading something, Nick? I see your lip moving like you're reading something. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was just reading about Herward Carrington uh -huh. and uh, David Abbott, two of the first kind of debunker pioneers, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Carrington's kind of an interesting guy. He wasn't necessarily always a debunker. He was kind of always on the borderline. Um, he traveled with some of the mediums. He wrote about them. He was He was an interesting guy. So what do you think – was the high point of the seance and the spook shows like with that general era of um of, sp of spiritualism i guess you would call it what what do you think was the high point of that would it be like the eight mid 1800s the early 1900s um the spiritualist movement itself probably peaked just before that habert commission came out um so we're talking like 1883, 84. Um, you also get this interesting thing that happens in 1888 where the Fox sisters come out and admit it was all fraud. So between that Habert commission and the Fox sisters confessing, that really kind of put an end to, or temporary end to spiritualism at that point. And uh, to seances. And then it, like I said, it comes back big time during a war as it, almost always does during any massive globally stressful event um it's interesting that at the beginning of the the pandemic when we went into lockdown i said i almost guarantee you we're going to see a huge rise in paranormal belief and mm -hmm did exactly that um and in fact i ended up getting interviewed on cnn about that and it was wow. one of those things that was fairly obvious to me that this always happens in wars and in, in pandemics anytime there's this huge stressful thing people turn to these beliefs so i know you kind of touched on this earlier so what's your opinion on the modern day psychics the or they call them referred to them as psychics the people that claim they could talk to the dead or see the dead uh what's your opinion on them do you think that some of them are legit do you think they're all kind of just for entertainment value or i think some absolutely believe what they are doing um <laughs> they're very earnest like i said i know a couple um there's a wonderful woman i know named patty negri who calls herself the good witch of hollywood and you'll see patty <laughs> on a lot of these shows like ghost adventures and so forth and i can absolutely guarantee that she is very in earnest. Um, I, I do a weekly report on a show called Ghost Magnet with Bridget Marquardt. Bridget is a reality television star who was one of the, the, the Hugh Hefner's girlfriends on the Girls yeah. Next Door and so forth. But oh, yeah. 
she's yeah she's she is a sensitive and i have been in a room with bridget where she would say oh i feel really strange right here my my chest suddenly feels very heavy like i can barely breathe and somebody would come along and go well that's the spot where blah 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 died now you know how she knew that in advance i don't think she did what is she responding to i don't know um but there's no question that she responded to something that she walks into these places and she, she feels these things. And um, so I think it's my theory on it is that some people may be wired neurologically in a very different way. They may be receptive to something like electromagnetic frequencies, the same things that set off a K2 meter, which has become yeah, a yeah. piece of ghost hunting equipment. And um you know, yeah. I I think that we may find one of these days something like that, but I don't know. Um. So, let me see. I got a couple questions left here. So, what do you think it was, or still is, that drives the seance? Like, why won't the seance kind of go away, or why won't the seance die? Why does it stay relevant in modern society, and why will it never go away? It's kind of, it's kind well, of like a broad... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting that you would ask that because seances, I think, are making a huge comeback right now. And one of the reasons they're making a huge comeback <laughs> is that we have grown to love these paranormal investigation shows on television. You know, they started about 20 years ago with things like Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them now. And mm -hmm. one things that you are starting to hear more and more coming out of these shows is the equipment is fun, but we get better results with a medium. Yeah. Um, and you didn't hear that even 10 years ago. Now you're starting to hear that more and more. And it seems like the mediums are becoming much more popular again. And I suspect we all love to believe that there is an afterlife, of course, and that there might be some way to communicate with the people who are there, our loved ones who have left us. I mean, who wouldn't want to mm -hmm. talk to your mom or your dad or your cat who died, yeah. whatever, you know? Tim and Nick, do you guys have any more questions? Because I'm I'm all out of questions. I don't know if you guys have any. I don't know. Like I said, I'm just enjoying that, listening to the information. Yeah, I was just kind of elaborating a little bit more on what you just said. So you, do you think people, we have this innate need for like beliefs in the afterlife and especially with troubling things going on like COVID recently, it drives us to believe in the supernatural kind of maybe as a form of escapism or something to that effect? Or a form of comfort. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that with COVID, we had that same thing where your loved one might be dying on the other side of the world and there was nothing you could do about it. You couldn't go see them. Um, you you weren't there at their, their ending, you know, and I think that was tremendously hurtful, of course, to many people. And, and if you could seek some comfort by going to a medium who said, I can put you in touch with them and here's what they say and they say they love you and everything's fine and, you know, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So my last question. So do you have any kind of announcements or upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Um, we'll talk about your website here in just a moment. I do. I have a new book coming out this year that will be out on October 1st that I'm really, really happy about um, because it's my first big coffee table art book. And that was something I always wanted to do. And it is called The Art of the Zombie Movie. That sounds cool. Yeah. Are you, are you, do you think you'll write another book on like the spiritualism movement? Or are you kind of done with that topic going on to other stuff now? Or I have a couple of proposals out for it. Um, at the beginning of the year, I signed with a new agent who is fantastic and he is out there shopping a couple of things for me right now. So uh, we will cross our fingers that there will be more. All right. So real quick. So uh, the last part of the show, we usually talk about your website. Is there anything that you would like to mention on your website we might not have talked about? Or is there anything you wanted to bring up before we start talking about like your links to your website? 
Um, I have just set up a an account at Substack, which is kind of fun. Um, and one of the things I'm doing at Substack is I'm trying to post once or twice a week all kinds of little ghost reports about haunted mm -hmm. places and famous yeah. people in paranormal history. So um, you can always get to my Substack through my website, lisamorton.com, and I'm just going to post a lot of fun ghost history stuff there. Sounds I'm awesome. I forgot to mention this. Well, okay, so I do have one more question. So I know you said you go out on like a lot of ghost hunts and things like that with your friends or people that invite you. Are you part of a group that does that? Or are you uh, just kind of tag along and people invite you? Yeah, it's not part of any official group. Um, I keep thinking I should join a group and I just haven't done it yet. I, I My schedule is so packed. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's hard to find time to do these. I, what, I, what I really like to do is set something up whenever I travel. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to another city and I know they have some really cool haunted thing there, I will try to take advantage of that. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. I know you said yeah, you had a busy thank you. schedule. Thank um, you, yeah. So yeah, I, had have, a good time. Uh, I would highly recommend for those of you that are watching that haven't read Lisa Morton's book, Calling the Spirits, A History of Seances. I read it myself. Uh, we talked about it for quite a while today. Very interesting. I'd say it's probably one of the best books yeah. I've ever read on the spiritualism topic. Yeah, I got to get a copy now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I great. definitely really will, too. Good. Thank Thanks you, Jeremy. For That's great. No problem. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Um, a future announcement for us real quick. I don't know if we are going to do a show this week or not. We usually do them on Fridays or Saturdays. Um, we actually, ironically, we're going to do a ghost hunt on Friday or Saturday. <laughs> so I might not do a go uh, show this week for our listeners. Um, again, thanks for coming on the show, Lisa. Uh, when yeah, your new you. book comes out, we'll have to have you back on the show. I'm sure. I know you wrote a history of Halloween book. That one is going to be the next one I'm going to read probably this week. It's right up Jeremy's alley. Yeah, yeah I, like, I was looking at the masks you have on the wall back there and some of the that artwork. Awesome. <laughs> and actually, the whole wall behind me back here is actually all my wall of Halloween art. So, oh, that's yeah, I was awesome. I trying to look at some of that while you were talking. Yeah, Jeremy, why don't you tell her some of what you have? Yeah, I collect like old 19, I'd say early 1900s up until about the Korean War old uh, Halloween paper machés and like die cuts and things like that. Nice. I have like a big display case with all that stuff set up in our front room. And uh, I have like a big Universal Monsters collection hanging up all in our front room over there. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, uh, thank I'm you pretty so sure much. I'll have you back on either for when your new book comes out or we'll try to do the history of Halloween when that season comes back around. Um definitely a great author i love your book yep thank, thank you. you yeah thank, thank you. you thanks for coming on this right. is great thanks for inviting me no problem good have a good night, night. you too